what I want to do today is uh, talk a little bit about about data and uh, just do a, like a real brief primer on Excel. Okay, is who has used Excel? Okay, who feels really confident in their Excel skills? Okay, there's a handful of people. All right, good. Um, if you feel really confident, or, or if you don't feel confident, look around the room at some of those people that do feel confident and, and find one of them to, to talk to when we start doing these uh, assignments. We're not doing like really crazy stuff for data analysis in this class, but you are gonna need to, to be sort of confident in some basic things like how to calculate averages and you know, how to do a confidence interval or put a graph together right in Excel. So I'm just, I, I wanna go over a few of those things today uh, and, and play with a little bit of data. I, I put a, um, a file up on uh, Blackboard this morning and sent an announcement around so you can get the, the, the data that we'll work with. Um, I, these slides really aren't like that sort of useful or necessary for uh, working with the data, but I can post these as well if you guys would like to, uh, to see those. Um, so I just, I don't know, I like these stupid little memes and cartoons, but, but really, I mean, these are the three things we're going to talk about, data, format, and formulas, and those are sort of the three pieces for working with data in Excel that we need to sort of pay attention to, right? Um, a lot of people I see spend a lot of time making their spreadsheets look pretty. Um, and by and large, I would say that making your spreadsheet look pretty sort of gets in the way of actually being able to analyze the data, right? And I'll show you some examples of that. So we keep things simple, um, keep things pretty clean and, and streamlined. Um, okay, so what do we need to sort of be able to do in Excel? Uh, we need to be able to sort of move data around and reformat it and make it tidy. I'm gonna talk about what tidy data is here in a second. Um, you need to be able to create formulas uh, and format numbers, basic descriptive statistics, means, minimums, maximums, uh, uh, standard deviations, variances, things like that. So those are basic functions in Excel. Um, uh, T values, confidence intervals, uh, simple T tests, and then graphing, right? Bar charts with error bars, simple linear graphs, those kinds of things, okay? If you can do those things already, or think you can figure them out, you're gonna be really well set for the rest of the class. If you uh, have a little sort of trepidation about any of these things, hopefully we can clear some of that up today. Um, you can always uh, email me, uh, call me, stop by the office, and I can help you out with some things or point you to some resources. There's also a ton of stuff online if you just search for uh, you know, whatever you need to do we posted some things to the resources uh, section or resources tab of BB Learn on a couple of these things too, especially like confidence intervals and error bars and charts. Those are some of the, the trickier things. Okay, okay. what well, tidy data is, is actually like a term uh, that we use in data science and it's sort of a way or a set of principles for formatting the data that we have. And, and it's so we set up the data so that it's really easy to analyze, okay? So that we can, it's really flexible. We can sort of squish the data around as we need to, but we don't have a whole lot of baggage that comes in just because the data are formatted weird, okay? And so the, the kind of basic principles of tidy data are that every row in your table is an observation, okay? So if it's a plot, if the plot is your sort of observational unit, don't worry if you don't know what that means because we're going to talk about that a lot here, here in the next couple of weeks. But if the plot is your observational unit, then every row in your table corresponds to a different plot, okay? And you don't mix types. You don't have some rows being plots and some rows being transects and some rows being like allotments, okay? Every row has to be the same animal, right? Okay? Same thing with the variables, right? The variables go in your columns. So if you're counting plants, right? If it's density of blue bunch wheatgrass, that's a column, okay? And you don't mix types within a column. You can have one column that's for blue bunch and one column that's for, you know, uh, 
stipa and one column that's for sagebrush, right? So you keep those split out, but don't mix and match, right? Um, and then, yeah, one type of observational unit per, per table, right? So if we're gonna go really in terms of tidy data, then you'd have like density data in one table, you'd have cover data in another table, right? You can link those two tables together, but it helps keep them sort of clean and keep them separate, right? This isn't really um, a huge deal for Excel because Excel is pretty forgiving and flexible. But if you get to like you're analyzing research data and you need to do it in a statistics package or you need to hand data off to somebody else to do something with, then the tidy data thing becomes more, more and more important, okay? Also with tidy data, there's not a lot of extra space in there around the formatting. If you think about if I had to read that into another computer program, the extra space can really screw with you, okay? Um, and this last one is really important. We often collect data in very untidy ways, right? Think of a, of a data form, a field data form that, that you've seen or you've filled out, okay? That's really set up for convenience <coughs> so, so that stuff makes sense. It's kind of like well separated and compartmentalized and organized for how you would work through that in the field. But, but those probably aren't like really well set up to analyze those data, okay? So you'll have to, input those data and then maybe restructure them or move them around to, uh, to, to work with the data that you have, okay? So it's not like untidy data isn't always a bad thing, okay? We just need to sort of separate out like, you know, where is our untidy data and why is it untidy? And then, you know, tidy it up for the analysis that we do. So let's look at a couple of examples here. Um, so this is an untidy example, okay? What makes this untidy? Can anybody kind of point out something that, that is untidy about this? What do you see? Alex, what do you see? There's like multiple headings. Yeah. And so you have the poetry as well. So same cover and then graphs for the Yep. Yeah, okay, good. So you, we've got two levels of header rows, right? Okay. Um, again, visually appealing, but, but from an analysis standpoint, analysis standpoint uh, it, it, it can cause problems, right? Okay, so good. What else do you see in here? How about what's, what's happening right here? We have blank, we don't have a column header, right? Now in this case, there's actually a set of data above this, right, which is the pre-treatment data. And they put the column header there, but not down below, right, okay? So, but again, we just cookie cuttered a little piece of this data out, and now we're missing a column header, okay? Um, good. Also, it's one data set, right? We have pre-treatment and post-treatment but yet we separated them by a whole bunch of spaces between them to be, again, visually appealing, right? But from an analysis standpoint, that actually makes things more complicated, all right? So we don't want a bunch of extra space in there. And then the last thing is, now these haven't been filled in here, but, but what's this stuff down at the bottom, right? Okay, well, that's, those are analysis results, averages and standard deviations. And that's actually, that's a different type of information. Right? So, so these are your, your raw data, and then your average and your confidence interval, those are your results. Those really belong someplace else. Okay? They don't belong here with these, with these data. All right? So these are kind of just some ways that make this sort of an untidy thing um, and, and can end up sort of tripping you up and complicating things. Okay? This is, I mean, this isn't, it's pretty to look at, right? You know, it's, just a, it's a table full of data, but in terms of analyzing and working with these data, this is actually a much cleaner representation, okay? It's all the same data, with the exception that I actually brought the pretreatment data in, okay? I simplified the column headers and then just collapsed everything down. This is a, it's a much more condensed format, but when it comes to actually like pulling these numbers and creating graphs and doing analysis, this is gonna be easier for us to work with, right? Okay, 
Questions on tidy data? I'm totally up on the soapbox right now. So, you know, you don't have to agree with me, I guess, but um, I've done this a lot. So, okay. All right. I post, there's a video on, uh, on uh, tidy data that I put on uh, BB Learn from a group called Data Camp. Um, and and uh, one guy with Data Camp is, is Hadley Wickham is the guy that actually sort of came up with or like codified these tidy data principles. It's like a seven or eight minute long video uh, that talks about these things, gives some other examples. It's, it's, uh, it's, if you have the time, if you're interested, it's kind, of, it's kind of good. Okay, so we're gonna practice some of these Excel skills with a data set that was uh, collected in New Mexico, just like when, as part of this Restore New Mexico project. Um, so yeah, yeah. Data sets, I don't know that access to. Anybody else have that problem? Everybody's having that problem, great. My, Track record with BB Learn is really great this year. So, okay, uh, hold on, we'll figure that out here in a, in a sec. Thanks, Bill. Okay, Restore New Mexico project in uh, in New Mexico was a it's a BLM project. It was started back in 2005, and the whole point with with Restore New Mexico is that they were trying to do treatments to address uh, uh, shrub encroachment on uh, rangelands in the desert southwest okay um, so and they, they were really after kind of trying to get back to the, the sort of historic grasslands that dominated uh, uh, New Mexico right um, and um, and do this on a really large scale okay I mean they if they were treating by the time I left New Mexico last year they had treated millions and millions of acres uh, as part of this restored New Mexico treatment um, in an effort to try to knock back shrubs and promote growth of grass and forbs. And so this is sort of like the, the, the backstory, right? What they were after. And, and the map on the left is sort of a historic kind of what we think New Mexico was like, uh, you know, 100 years ago, which was mostly uh, uh, grasslands, right? Desert grasslands. So black grandma, blue grandma grasslands, okay? What we've had now is the combination of fire suppression and some really kind of like severe drought events and overgrazing, sort of drought coupled with overgrazing through like the 50s and 60s, we saw a, a sort of a transition or shift of these grasslands to now being dominated by creosote and mesquite, okay? Uh, and what happens in a lot of those situations then is that it actually changes the, the hydrology of these rangelands, right? And you get sort of dune formation around these mesquite plants, which then sort of favors the growth of these deep rooted mesquites and sort of starts to, to kind of, uh, you know, dry out or choke out these uh, native grasses in these areas, okay? So BLM was really interested in, hey, if we remove this shrub component, will we get grass back in these, in these systems, okay? Um, so yeah, return it to a more normal successional state, um, stabilize soils, increase forb uh, and grass production, right? Okay. Um, they did a number of different things, um, mechanical removal, herbicides, um, I think they even did some fire more up in northern New Mexico. Um, but by and large, most of the treatments were uh, uh, herbicide applications, heavy fire. Okay, so the data that we're gonna look at today came from um, uh, a data set, Carlsbad, New Mexico, uh, where they did some sort of transects, pulled some transects out, 100 foot long transects. Um, pre-treatment sampling and then two to three years following treatment and then they recover estimates using this line intercept method. There's Calvin and Mike collecting a bunch of data. Um, okay, and these are just a couple of examples, right? So pre-treatment on the left, you can see, just work. Yes. Yeah, so this is all creosote here, right? Um, and this is pretty typical, right? So you have a lot of creosote then with just not much happening in between it, right? Okay, so pre-treatment, and then uh, once they come in and, and sort of uh, hit this area with the herbicides, 
then this is what they want to see afterwards, right? <coughs> it's a sort of nice reestablishment of perennial bunch grasses after the fact. Okay. Um, here's another one though that I would suggest is maybe a little bit more marginal success. Uh, Pre-treatment, post-treatment. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of grass growth here underneath the uh, dead skeletons of these, uh, of these shrubs, but not a lot happening in this sort of uh, interspaces here. Okay. So that's a little bit of the backstory of the of the data set that we're going to work with. Um, this is kind of what we're what we're after here. So um, let's see if um, I think the best way to do this. Actually, I think I can do this. I have that file is on here. If you guys want to. Did anybody get this on their computer? Or yeah. you, you guys got it, but the I wonder if it's like the 504 students that couldn't get it. Okay. Um, there's a folder on here called REM410. Uh, you guys can pass that around. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that okay? So these are the data. These are from 10 plots that they did, right? 10 transects, pre-treatment, post-treatment. Uh, pre-treatment was 2000, 2006, post-treatment was 2009. Uh, we've got three different uh, indicators that were measured here, uh, grass cover, that's perennial, uh, grass cover, forb cover, and shrub cover, okay? Um, so the first thing we want to do is just some descriptive statistics uh, on this on this data set. So anybody just throw out some some ideas or some some, some suggestions, what should we, what would be the first thing we'd want to do here? Mean, okay, that's good. Um, so what I'm going to do also is just set up a, uh, a space here in this worksheet, kind of apart from my data, where my results are going to be. Okay, so I could say uh, pre pre treatment here, post treatment. And then let's do the mean, right? What's the function for doing a mean in Excel? Is there a function called mean in Excel? Isn't it just equals or mean? It's equals, but there's no function called mean. This just really bugs me. It's called average. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Okay. So to do a function in Excel, you start with the equal sign. And then whatever the function is, right? So in this case, it's average. Um, and then you just can can open it with sort of open parentheses and then just grab whatever data that you want. So so right here, these first 10 values are my pre-treatment for, for grass cover. Okay. And hit enter. All right, that's the that's as easy as it is. Okay. Anybody? We okay with that so far? Everybody's good with that. Okay. All right. So then let's do the same thing for my post treatment data right here. Anybody else need it? Okay. Good. Okay. All right. Good. So I don't know. It looks like there's a difference, right? Six and a half, uh, that's percent, right? Cover in percent. So six and a half percent cover for pre treatment versus 24, roughly 24 and a half for post treatment, right? That looks pretty good. What else do we need to do though, if we're going to just kind of kind of poke around at these data and figure out what's going on? What might, might be the next thing we'd want to calculate?
Anything? What do you think, Paul? Standard deviation. Standard deviation. Okay, good. What does a standard deviation mean? You guys, has everybody heard of the standard deviations? Okay, what's a standard deviation? I don't need a technical description, just a, just a, a concept. What's it tell you? How much your uh, average could be off plus or minus? Yeah, it's sort of like the spread around the average, right? Yeah, yeah. Are the data all sort of tightly clustered around that average or mm -hmm. are they really spread out, right? There's a, is there a lot of variability or a little variability? Okay, good. All right. So what's the what's the Excel formula for standard deviation? S dev, yeah, S T. Uh, you know, it's so great. It's like old school chalk even. Uh, now there's two flavors of standard deviation formula in Excel, right? There's the stdev.p and .s, okay? For almost everything we do in this class, we want the .s flavor, okay? Do you, guys, do you know what the difference is between the two of them? Okay. Um, all right. I don't expect you to remember this, but so the, the, the formula for standard deviation, right, is the square root of the, the sum of the uh, square differences divided by the sample size, right? Okay. That is the, the sdev.p right there, okay? So if what you had was the entire population, right? So if I was interested in like, what's the standard deviation of the ages of everybody in this room, okay? But all I care about is this room, then this room is my population of people and that's the one that I would use, okay? But if I want to know what's the standard deviation of all the people in CNR, right? Okay. But I'm going to do that by just kind of taking all the ages of the people in this room, right? And this room is just a sample, probably actually a pretty lousy sample of all the people in CNR, right? Okay. And in that case, I need to correct for the fact that this sample is really only a small portion of all the people that are that are possibly in CNR, okay? And and so this ends up not being a, a an accurate estimate of that standard deviation. So I have to adjust for this for the sample size and do a minus one, right? That's called a again. You don't need to know this, right? I just I geek out on this stuff, okay? So but this is called the finite population correction factor, okay? Um, so. Most of the stuff that we do in the class is going to be on samples. Okay? It's, it's pretty rare that we'll have like an entire population of something that we're going to be looking at. So take home value here, take home lesson is that standard dev dot S is what we want in Excel. Okay? That was just like totally long winded answer for something really pretty simple. Okay? So standard dev dot, dot S right there. And then I can just grab my numbers. All right, there we go. 7.167, right? Uh, let's do that for this too. Okay, and then 14 is my other one, right? Right. Standard deviations in the same units as my, my mean, right? So that's 7.17%. That's my standard deviation. Okay. Everybody cool with that? Mean standard deviations? You can do the same thing for minimum, it's min. For maximum, it's max. If you need to do the range, which I don't know why we would want to do the range right now, but you can just take the, 
maximum minus the minimum, right? Okay. The other thing that we're gonna we're gonna really want here is what is our sample size? Um, and we could count. We could just say, okay, well, there's ten of them here, so I know my sample size is ten, right? But sometimes your sample size will vary, right? Sometimes you don't know what it is ahead of time, okay? So there's a there's a a function here uh, in Excel called count. And then we can just give it the same range of numbers here. And it'll just, you know, it just counts them up, right? It says, oh yeah, there's 10 of those. Okay. Same thing down here. All right. Questions? Let me get my little cheat sheet out here. Okay, the next thing then we want to do is calculate a confidence interval. Okay. Um, does everybody, so what's a confidence interval? Somebody, somebody explain that to me. Simply, explain it simply. We'll go into more depth what a confidence interval is and what it means in, in a couple of weeks, right? But just like, like five second definition, what's a confidence interval? Really? Go for it. Yeah. 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 No, that's 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 actually a great, you know, sort of definition, right? It's yeah, like how confident are we that the real value is sort of well aligned with this value that we got from our sample, right? Or actually better probably say it the other way. The confidence that the value that we got from the sample is actually close to the real value, right? Okay, that's our confidence interval. And we can say that, well, we want to be 95% confident, right? So that'll give us a range of values. And then we say, well, the true value is you know, probably somewhere between the, these two extremes, right? Okay. So the thing with a confidence interval, though, when we calculate it, what Excel is going to give us is actually the width of the confidence interval. Okay, so let's do that right now. Um, let's just for fun do 95% uh, confidence uh, width, right? Okay. So here I'm going to, and so it's just uh, it's just called confidence uh, dot t. Okay. Again, we're working with samples uh, in this class, so it's it's more appropriate for us to use the confidence interval from the, from the t distribution, not from the normal distribution, right? Because we're not dealing with the entire population. Okay, so confidence dot t. Uh, okay, our alpha, that's our, again, we're gonna get into this all in a couple of weeks, right? But our type one error rate, okay? Which is like, if I wanna be 95% confident, then my, my error rate is 5%, okay? So I have to put that 5% in here, right? So <coughs> 0 0.05 is the number I'm gonna put in, okay? And then I need the standard deviation, which we already calculated, which is over here, in L2, cell L2. And then I need the sample size, which we calculated right here. All right, close that guy off and hit return, okay. Is everybody okay with how I got that? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just repeat that for, for the one below it. Okay, so that is the width of my confidence interval and so in, um, Okay, so for this, right, for, for the confidence interval, so we have our, our mean plus or minus the, the confidence interval width, right? So our, the, the lower, in, in this case, the lower bound of our confidence interval, um, right, is going to be our mean minus this confidence interval, 
and then the upper bound is going to be the mean plus this confidence interval width, right? Okay, so here you go. There's our confidence interval. So we say we're 95% confident that the true mean is between 1.4 and 11.7%. Okay. And we can do the same thing for our post-treatment data. Okay, 95% confidence interval is 14.3 to 34.5, okay? All right, questions? Yeah, yeah, here, I'll just blank these guys out here. Okay, so then we're gonna say, uh, the, so so we calc, you're okay with how we calculated the confidence width, right? Okay, and so then for the lower part of the confidence interval, it's gonna be the mean, minus the width and then the upper is going to be the mean plus the width okay okay so the last thing we want to do here is uh, a t-test is, is a t-test kind of a foreign idea to anybody? Okay, good. So a t-test is just a statistical test to tell if two samples came from different populations, right? So in this case, the, the, the test is, is the post-treatment different than the pre-treatment, right? Was there actually an effect that we would say is different than just chance, different than random? Okay, um, and uh, and interestingly, I mean, we have all the information we need right here, actually, to 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 answer that question. All the t-test is going to do is give us a probability statement with that, right? Which is going to say, oh yeah, this is like there's only a you know, two percent probability that that was actually due to chance, that difference. Okay, so uh, to do the t-test, so um, here, right? Uh, it's really easy. It's t uh, dot test. Okay, and then we're actually going to give it the, the the raw data values. So here's the first set, and then I'm going to uh, do a comma, and then the second set right here. Okay. Now there's two other things I need to tell it for the t test. Okay, one is if we want to do a, a one-tailed or a two-tailed t-test. Okay, uh, again, without getting into sort of the, the sort of semantics of this, we'll almost always do two-tailed t-tests. Okay, <coughs> and then the second thing it needs to know is like what type of data we have. Is it paired data? Which I guess technically these are paired data, but we're not going to treat them like that for today. Uh, is it a two sample with equal variance or a two sample with unequal variance? And it actually, oh, cool, it actually says heteroscedastic. That's like one of my favorite words. Um, okay, and so what this is, is asking, right, is like, are your standard deviations the same between these samples, right? Um, and if, they are great that's just a simpler sort of calculation if they're not then there's like like more like statistics jujitsu you have to do right um, and Excel is going to do all that it just needs to know what it is and so if we look up here at these at these numbers basically it's when it says equal variance it's saying are these two numbers the same <clears throat> or can you reasonably guess or assume that the standard deviations of these two groups are the same and what would you say here? Yeah, I'd probably say no here as well, right? Okay, so um, so we're gonna actually say, yeah, two sample unequal variance, which is at the value three here. We're gonna close that guy off, okay? 
and it's going to give us our result. Okay, so this is a probability value, or you call it a p-value. Okay, so this is 0 0.003, which is like 0.3%. So there's a 0.3% probability that the difference we're seeing here, the difference between 6.5 and 24.5, and there's a 0.3% chance that that was just like totally random. That's not actually due to the fact that there was like a treatment effect here. That's pretty low, right? I mean, I'd buy a lottery ticket on those odds, right? Okay. Um, so we we can, yeah, pretty reasonably say that yes, there was a treatment effect that happened here, right? Okay. All right. Anybody like totally freaked out by the sort of concepts, the math here? The, the sort of the, 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 the way that we're working with the data. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So would you go through and do that again for four of the drugs? Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, that's one approach to doing it. Um, you know, if, if you want to kind of like, like technically get into it, there's a, a little bit more sort of steps we have to do. If, that's called multiple comparisons. And, you know, there's like more things we have to do because if we start doing just a whole bunch of t-tests in a row <coughs> for all these differences, then it, it ends up kind of like inflating the, the, the well, deflating the error associated with them, right? So, um, but I don't, for like, for, for this class, for 410, like this isn't a stats class, so we're not going to worry about that. We're, I'm after sort of concepts here. But, but yeah, you could just do the same thing, um, you know, for, for each one of these different indicators yeah okay everybody good with how we got the the, the, the t-test value here okay good so last thing that we want to do then is actually graph this okay um, and uh, there's a number of different ways that we could do this um, if you if you just highlight these data here and then come over to insert and just pick like like a bar graph here. Just a straight up bar graph. Okay. It gives you that. Which is, I mean, that's that's cool. That's legit, right? I mean, that's that's actually like a graph that shows you the difference here. Okay. The the trick is we want to put error bars on this. And all error bars are is like the confidence interval, right? That's what we're going to put on here. Uh, is confidence interval error bars. Okay. Um, the the trouble with this is if you just do it this way, the way Excel works is it only it wants to put the same error bar on on each bar, right? But they're different for us. Okay. So we need to actually switch this up so that they're not considered the same. It calls this a series, right? Um, like, oh yeah, these are these are the same data just kind of split out into two different bins, right? So we want to flip this around. So you can grab this kind of button here, this switch row and column, and it flips it around. Okay, so now I've got my pre-treatment data are the blue bar and my post-treatment data are the orange bar. Okay. And now I can actually go in and put different error bars on each one. So if I grab this guy, this plus uh, sign next to the chart, or I can come up here in the corner to add chart element, and I can choose error bars. And I actually want to choose this more error bars option. Uh, okay, we'll do pre-treatment first here. And we want to do custom. We're going to tell it what value. And so for the positive error value, we're going to give it the confidence interval width. And for the negative value, we're going to do the same confidence interval width, right? Because our confidence interval is symmetric. Okay, it's the same value plus or minus. Hit OK. There we go. There's my error bar. I can actually like make it a little fatter here. So it's easier to see, right? I, I can go all crazy on making that look weird, right? So 
Okay. What was your negative error value again? It's the same thing. It's that 95% confidence interval there. Okay. All right. I'm going to do the same thing for the for the post treatment data too. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm going to come up here, add chart element error bar to that one. Choose custom for the value. My positive one is going to be 10.06. My negative one is 10.06 as well. There we go. Let's make that guy fat too. Okay, there it is. All right. Now for um, for charts that you turn in as part of your projects or assignments. Um, Make sure you add uh, axis labels for both the both axes, and add a title to it as well. Okay, um, and give it something descriptive. You know, make make sure that we know what it is. Okay, I don't I don't like um, graphs that don't have any titles on them. Right, <coughs> it's hard to tell what's what's actually going on. What do you notice about the confidence intervals? Do they overlap the pre-treatment and post-treatment confidence intervals? They don't, right? So the fact that they don't overlap, we already know that at the 95% confidence level that these things are different from each other, okay? All the t-test is doing is just describing like how far apart these things are. Okay. All it does is put an actual like like value number to something that we could get just by looking at this graph. Right? It's all the same, same concept, same information there. Right? All right. We kind of plowed through that pretty quick. Do we have other questions? No. Okay. Everybody's comfortable with that? You can, you can, you can work through and do this. All right. I can, uh, I can post this sort of work example up on uh, BB Learn uh, as, as well. If you guys want to, want to get in there and see that and see kind of like, like play around with you know, sort of what I put where. Um, uh, we also, as just kind of like a commitment of the, of our department to sort of putting more all of our content, course content online, making it online accessible. I am recording all these lectures, which I find like extremely weird and uncomfortable. I don't like doing it, but so I can clean this up and edit out the parts where I look like an idiot and, and post that as well if you guys wanna, wanna see it too. So um, I take out all the parts where I look like an idiot. It's gonna be a really short video. Um, okay, so other thoughts or questions that you guys have on any of this stuff, what we're what we're expecting, you know, from from you in terms of analysis, data analysis is is, is pretty modest. Um, I can't think of much that we're going to do in Excel that's more complicated than what we just did right here. Okay, like, like I said, I'm I'm more interested in talking about like what the data mean and and like you know how to interpret the values that we get rather than you know kind of a deep dive into the statistical theory and you know of heteroscedasticity and you know what that means for you know like whatever right so um you know higher level concepts um uh, and again when it comes time to working on assignments if you're feeling sketchy about you know sort of working with excel or the math or anything team up with somebody who you know who, feels a little bit more confident okay it's totally cool to work together in here on things just make sure when you write your stuff up it's your own words your own write-up okay um, but but working on things together is encouraged all right other questions people have all right we'll, we'll, we'll call it good for today thank you